Well, good morning and good afternoon for those on the East Coast. My name is Lee Eilers and I'm president and CEO of Marine Process Solutions. And on behalf of Henry Alamzad and the Quezon team, as well as the Marion Process Solutions team, I want to welcome you to the Pursuit of Dryness webinar. We certainly hope that this time finds you and your families doing well and pressing on during this incredible time in history. We also hope that you will find the webinar instructional and well worth the investment of your time. We had over 170 participants on the webinar yesterday, and we expect to have uh, well over 100 today. So again, we are very grateful. You see the AMP logo on your screen on the slide deck, and an explanation of that logo is AMP, the Advanced Material Processing Group, is the umbrella that both Quezon and Marion sit under through May River Capital. And we are very proud to be a part of, of that group and uh, excited of the future of, of the organization. Before we start, I do wanna say, please don't hesitate to send questions either via the chat box on the right of your screen there, or if you scroll to the bottom of the slide deck, uh, there is a specific area there that you can ask questions. We will be monitoring that uh, over the course of the presentation and prioritizing questions that we feel would be beneficial for the vast majority of the audience. So again, feel free uh, to do that. So we have uh, two incredible experts presenting today. The first is Jim Jack. Jim is a fluid bed product manager for Quezon, and he has served and is serving as the instructor for the University of Wisconsin Dryer Technology course uh, for almost 20 years. Jim has worked in process and project design for several major dryer manufacturers, including uh, Capurian and Thanvik. In these positions, he was involved with spray, flash, fluid bed, belt, spiral, and indirect dryer. So we welcome Jim. Thanks, Lee. And uh, we have the foremost expert Thanks in for coming uh, drying to technology uh, uh, with this is Jim, Jim Shaw here. I'd also and, like to introduce uh, presentation Jason is going to be on continuous Jason is a teammate with me at WaveMix. Or excuse me, Hector Marion, promoting Wave Mix as the business unit director. Jason has been involved design. in hundreds of engagements this will include uh, with Wave Mix on and drying curves, the low temperature microwave thermal drying process. Time calculations, and uh, Jason brings and a wealth of knowledge and, and expertise that and he is excited to share with you the uh, during his, his portion of the presentation. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. Jim, the podium is yours. The second half will focus on fluid bed dryers. Yes. Um, the second half will focus on fluid bed dryers. Uh, a problem with most fluid bed dryers is handling particle size below 50 microns. We will be talking about a fluid bed with an integral mounted bag collector that can handle very fine powders. Depending on the application, there are some inherent advantages to a circular vibrating fluid bed, such as internal back mixing and uniform airflow. We will look at various vibrating fluid bed dryer applications. And if you're handling an organic product, you must think about protecting the equipment from an explosion. We will be looking at using higher pressure designs to minimize the size of the explosion protection equipment various direct dryer designs. Here we see rotary, flash, fluid bed, and spray dryers. These are all direct dryers using heated air to dry the feed. Indirect dryers like paddle, disc, screw, or drum dryer use a mechanical agitator to convey a wet feed against the steam jacketed surface. Why do we have so many different types of dryers? There is no dryer that can do everything. A spray or drum dryer handle pumpable liquids while other dryers handle liquids to pace. Flash fluid bed are considered air suspension dryers that allow the air to be in contact with the drying air 100% of the time, while a rotary dryer is only in contact with the air when the wet feed is dropped through the passing air. 
Here we see a direct dryer curve. Short residence time spray and flash dryers having a residence time of three seconds in a flash and about 25 seconds in a spray dryer only handle in the constant rate drying zone. And they may have difficulty getting down to the very low product moistures efficiently. Rotary and fluid bed dryers have residence time in minutes and are better suited for lower product moistures. It is not uncommon to have two stage dryers like a flash fluid bed or a spray fluid bed combination to maximize efficiency and also product quality. Key design information. Designing a direct dryer is all about air. One of the key design parameters of any direct dryer is the inlet air temperature, which is the temperature after the air heater and before the dryer. Here is shown as 400 degrees Fahrenheit. The outlet air temperature is the temperature after drying. Here you see on the diagram is 200 degrees Fahrenheit. The difference of these two defines the evaporative capacity of the direct dryer. Doubling this delta T, the delta T difference can double the evaporative capacity. So where do you get these temperatures? Well, testing gives you the best results, but you don't have the info. The first question that you must ask is how heat sensitive is the product? The rule of thumb is in the inlet air temperature can be 50 degrees centigrade above its sticky point or degradation point. A direct dryer is designed on evaporation rate, not on feed rate. The solids rate is the theoretical value without any moisture and differs from the product moisture, which contains some actual residual water. Here's a drying curve uh, on uh, chia seeds. Um, it's, it's a function, the drying curve is a function of percent moisture versus retention time. And samples uh, typically are taken every minute. Uh, after five minutes in, this, in the batch fluid bed, it reaches its desired product moisture of below 9%. Once the residence time is determined, you then take that data and scale up to a larger dryer, which is res residence time. Here we have two calculation examples of determining residence time in larger dryers. It is a simple calculation to obtain the residence time or the size of the dryer. The volume of the bed divided by the flow rate is equal to the residence time. Heat and mass balance. The residence time is only one part of the direct dryer design. You must also have enough heat and air to evaporate and carry away the moisture. If you don't have a computer dryer software, then you do a heat balance around the dryer as shown. If the Q in, which is the heat in, which is the drying air plus the feed temperature. If that is less than the Q out, which is the heat out, that's the product you want to dry and uh, you have uh, heat loss also as a result. The percent heat loss is higher in a small dryer than in a larger dryer. It can range from two to 20%. After teaching this uh, course for many years now, I realized that you need to be a weather person to understand and model the operation of a direct dryer. Besides residence time, inlet and outlet temperature, one needs to make sure that the outlet air moisture levels are low enough to still dry the material. There is a relationship of outlet air moisture and product moisture. The amount of moisture in the air and how much the air has expanded varies in each stage of the dryer 
as seen on this diagram. I relate the weather inside the direct dryer as being a cloud containing water vapor. The slide show how the cloud expands and contracts in each stage. Stage one is the ambient moisture entering the direct dryer system and shows a small cloud with a little amount of moisture. Stage two is the air heater that greatly expands the air and adds some moisture from burning natural gas. The higher amount of heated air from the natural gas air heater, the more the air expands and allows the air to carry away more water vapor. In essence, the expanded heated air makes the airstream stronger to absorb more water vapor. Stage three, we feed the cloud with moisture via, via the dryer. And in stage four, the cloud is cooled and contracts as a result of evaporation. The amount of moisture in the exhaust air is the addition of moisture added in each stage. The moisture in the outlet air has to be below 100% saturated on a weight basis. This relationship is called the percent adiabatic saturation ratio or percent ASR. Depending on the temperature profile and the required product moisture, an acceptable percent ASR is in the 70 to 90 percent range. This all can be modeled on a psychometric chart. Now we will concentrate on vibrating fluid bed dryers. 13. In this picture, we see a typical pilot plant circular vibrating fluid bed. The upper right picture shows a pilot plant dryer. The bottom right shows a picture of a highly fluidized powder with very high volcanoes. The top left picture shows cranberries being mechanically agitated inside a vibrating fluid bed. And the bottom left is a picture of a pelletized catalyst being fluidized. The basic operation of the uh, uh, vibrating fluid bed shown here is that uh, typically there are two fans, one on the supply and one on the exhaust. And we're trying to get good fluidization and get a zero point at the inlet, which is at the top of, of the dryer. And we're able to get very uh, high heat transfer coefficient and dry the material very effectively and balancing the, that zero point. Bag top dryer. This is a fluid bed that has a dust collector mounted on top of it, as you can see. The advantage of this design is to be able to use higher air velocities through the bed and get higher evaporation rates without worrying about entrainment to the remote dust collector. The powder is kept in the drying zone. The downside of this design is cross-contamination if you're handling more than one product. Some companies actually will have sets of cartridges or bags per, uh, that are, are peculiar to each one of those uh, of their products. Static versus vibrating. Okay, when to use a static fluid bed and when to use a vibrating fluid bed? The answer is very simple. You always use a static fluid bed unless you can't. The reason to use a static fluid bed is that the bed depth is in feet versus a vibrating fluid bed, which is in inches. This reduces the overall size and airflow of the dryer. The inefficiency of a direct dryer is the hot air that you exhaust. So minimizing the amount of air makes the dryer more efficient. Vibrating fluid beds can handle a wide range of shapes and sizes. Static fluid beds are limited to a very narrow particle size distribution, granular material or pelletized material with a one-to-one -one L over D. 
A good application for static fluid beds would be PVC or maybe ceramic propens or plastic pellets. Fibrating fluid beds are much more common than static fluid beds. Rice fluidization. Here a picture tells a, a thousand words. The side-by-side -side pictures show a static fluid bed versus a vibrating fluid bed handling a, a long L over D rice grain. The non-vibrated bed creates rat holes in the bed, letting the hot air drying, drying air bypass and short circuit the bed, while the vibrating fluid bed gives uniform treatment throughout and very good contact of the air and the rice. Internal back mixing. Okay, in the next few slides, we'll look at comparing a circular fluid bed with a rectangular one. And one of the big advantages is shown here, most dryers have difficulty handling a sticky paste. The conventional approach is to use an external back mixer, like a paddle blender, to mix some of the dry material with the incoming wet paste to give it a consistency that the dryer could handle. Here we see a different concept of, of the internal back mixing. A bed of semi-dry material is seeded with dry and semi-dry material or with an initial interrupted run to allow the dryer to develop a bed of semi-dry materials. These techniques would only be used on startup. The feed is shut off for five minutes until the lumps turn into powder and then the screw feeder feeds the paste. The feed blends with the semi-dry material in the middle of the dryer and eventually is discharged as a uniform dry powder. Airflow. The most glaring difference between a circular fluid bed and a rectangular one is that the air travels in a circular pattern. This presents a problem for a rectangular unit since the corners can have dead areas. Some manufacturers try to install cages or excessive pressure drops below the air distribution plate to minimize this effect. But this adds to clean out issues or much higher energy costs. It's like putting in a square peg in a round hole. A common application for a fluid bed is air separation. In this application, uniform accurate air velocities are very, they give the best results. Bed depth. As discussed in slide 15, there are advantages of a deeper bed, smaller footprint and less air required. In a rectangular unit, the bed varies to overcome the internal weirs so that the bed can vary in depth and not utilize the full capacity of the dryer. In a circular unit, the bed depth can be more uniform and deeper. Dehumidification. Here we have an application where the material is very heat sensitive and the ambient moisture in this location can be very humid. By cooling the air down, we condense out moisture to a 45 degree dew point with a cooling coil. This dehumidification removes the fluctuations of wetting of weather conditions. This is very common in the milk industry, especially for products with low operating temperatures like this one. Cleanability. A big advantage of a circular design is the ease of clean out. Here we see a baby food dryer cooler on the left and a spice dryer cooler on the right. And it, in these units, they are both equipped with an airlift to make it easier to get quick access and removal of the bed deck. Dust collector discharge. Okay, this is a unique application. Uh, instead of the material being discharged from the outlet or discharge of the fluid bed, it is blown over to the dust collector and discharged through a rotary airlock. Here we're dealing with nylon fibers that are very heavy and when they're wet, and 
uh, when you dry, they become very lightweight and they're easily blown off the bed to the dust collector and all the product is, is collected in the dust collector. The key is the air velocity needs to be uniform and accurate to make sure the semi-dry material does not short circuit prior to final drying. This is an ideal application for a circular fluid bed design. Explosion protection, explosion protection is a necessary evil. It becomes more complex and adds cost to the standard system. To help minimize these effects, we can maximize the pressure design of the dryer to reduce the size and cost. The 12 PSI design was for an ST3 powder, while we went for a 4 PSI, PSI design for an ST2 powder. The circular design lends itself to be designed for higher pressures. Summary. What have we learned today? Well, there are many direct and indirect dryer designs, but there is no one dryer that can do everything. Residence time is the basis for dryer design. Minimizing airflow optimizes heat efficiency. In order to understand what is happening inside your direct dryer, you should become a weather person and model your dryer on a psychometric chart. Circular vibrating fluid beds have some unique advantages such as internal back mixing, explosion protection, deeper bed depths, and more uniform airflow. Explosion protection complicates the design, but higher design pressures minimize the amount. Okay, uh, in our next presentation, we will look at an innovative low temperature batch microwave dryer called Wave Mix. And that's going to be by Jason Boyles. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Jim. Uh, Jim's presented to you one method of thermal processing, and that is using hot air as a means for removing moisture from a material. Uh, another approach would be the utilization of microwave, and that's what I'm going to discuss in the next few slides. What you see here is not an octopus. This is an industrial piece of machinery designed for thermal processing. I'm gonna use the photo to walk through the core fundamentals and components of the system and explain the process. Please draw your attention to the right side. You'll look at two stainless steel boxes. These are microwave transmitters. In this case, each of these develops 75,000 watts of microwave power. To put that into perspective, your home or kitchen microwave will develop about 1,000 watts. Microwave is part of the same spectrum as radio frequency, and it travels through the air. So unless you direct it, it'll go wherever it wants. The most common way in uh, using a waveguide is the white rectangular box-shaped ductwork that you're looking at there. So the microwave energy travels through the ductwork waveguide into an applicator. In this case, the applicator is a horizontal mixer. There are other types of and ways to apply microwave energy. Other common types are through an oven or through a conveyor belt. Those utilize a static material environment where a mixer would be a fluid or dynamic material environment. The other core component in this application is the utilization of micro or vacuum, sorry. Vacuum lowers the boiling points of material. So in the case that you have a higher boiling point of a moisture that you're trying to remove or your boiling point is higher than the material degradation, you need to lower that boiling point to effectively remove it. In this case, when you combine all these core technologies together, 
you begin to define what is low temperature thermal processing. Even temperature disbursement. Now the key to microwave processing is not to pump all 75,000 watts into the material all at once. In fact, the real key is to vary the power and even shut it off at times for effective processing. In order to do this, you need a data point. Stepping back into your kitchen, the data point that you use to get the perfect temperature out of your microwave is a subjective measurement by a user. That is not logical in an industrial process, nor is it the most accurate. In a thermal process, the most logical measurement that you want to use is material temperature. In this case, there's no subjective measurement. It's taken from the actual material. You could use things like an RTD or an infrared sensor to measure the material temperature. The image that you're looking at is a thermal image, and this would represent what's possible when you use mixing as the microwave applicator. In this case, what you get is a very consistent fluid bed of material, no hot spots, and so the material temperature is uniform throughout the entire bed that you're processing. When you couple the real-time measurement of temperature and make decisions based on the data, you can see how you begin to get the optimum material quality, the optimum efficiency out of one process. This leads me to discuss a little bit about material quality. And I can't stress this enough. This picture does tell the story of a thousand words. Anyone that's got the uh, microwave in their kitchen knows this exactly. And that is the analogy of using microwave to heat up your mashed potatoes and you have to stir it after a few seconds. Now, relating this to an industrial process, a finished drying process, you're typically working with a material that has had a mechanical dewatering step performed to it. This could be a filter press or perhaps a centrifuge. So what you're working with is a material that's already starting with a very low moisture, in which case is a bonded moisture. It's going to be deep within the material at a molecular level. And so looking again at the image, I don't know what you would choose to perform that process, but I would choose the picture on the left heating from the inside out. Again, the image on the right would represent burning, case hardening, in a very non-gentle method of removing that bonded moisture. So before we leave this slide, the only way to get to less than 2% moisture without material degradation is going to be using a direct means like microwave. The question that we always get is how much efficiency can I gain? The drying curve that you're looking at here is presented the same way any drying curve in any thermal processing literature would be. But let me briefly describe what you're looking at on this graph. On the left, you'll see material, or I'm sorry, temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. On the right, moisture in terms of a percentage, and on the bottom, time in minutes. The orange bar represents a material degradation temperature of 170 degrees Fahrenheit. In this case, we ran two identical, two processes at the same temperature, which was 160 degree processing temperature to develop a cushion from the material degradation point. The blue line represents a jacketed mixer run with a vacuum. You can see that the falling rate and the drying curve is very consistent while the energy being applied to the material to be dried was also very consistent. The other thing that you'll see is that after four hours, we achieved a moisture of 20% from the starting 80%. Furthermore, you'll see that the falling rate began to plateau 
you could continue to run this process for many more hours, but the moisture removal is marginal at best. Shifting your focus to the green line, this is what is possible when you combine microwave mixing and vacuum together. You see that the temperature increased in a relative short time and we began to remove moisture from the material in after 15 to 20 minutes. What this does is steepens the curve and you can dry material to precise moisture levels very quickly. In this case, after two and a half hours, we've dried this material down to below 2% moisture. Taking those real-time measurements at the end as the moisture was removed allows us to do this without degradating the material. So if you need the ability to dry to very low moisture with high precision in very much less time with overall better material quality, that could be a possible solution. I wanted to give some idea of possible microwave thermal processing applications. When you look at the five industry bullet points on the slide, these all represent applications that have been successful using microwave as a thermal processing method. The hemp industry in the biomass is a very emerging application. The chemical industry, performance and specialty compounds and mixtures also oftentimes need a finished drying step. When you think about very thermable materials like cellulosic, graphene, polymers, and nanomaterials, and then food, powders, and slurries that focus on aesthetics to the consumer need a very gentle thermal processing method. This all drives towards high value product. So if you need to dry to less than 2% and you have a product that you can't afford to lose, then microwave could be a possible solution. Finally, we wanted to leave you with this, which is an optimal engagement process for developing a solution for your challenge. The first step should be a very thorough discovery step. Without this, your business's goals can't be at the forefront of the solution development process. Testing. We have a great lab at Marion, and I can't tell you how fun it is to see R&D scientists discover something that they didn't know was possible. So testing should be a very thorough step in the process as well. Trust but verify. If a solutions provider can't provide empirical data or doesn't have the ability to test their, your material and their technology, then I would question the ability to deliver the best solution. Solution provider will develop and provide you with what they feel is the optimal solution, but I would challenge you to scrutinize the heck out of that. And if there isn't an easily understood and calculated ROI or return on investment, then I would think again. And finally, maybe the most important step of an engagement process is project management. If you sense that this is an afterthought of a solutions provider, then I would, I would not waste your time as this will end up costing you more money than it would be to pace the project and select the right solutions provider. And this concludes my portion of the presentation. Uh, Jim and I will work through the bottom, uh, the questions that are posed at the bottom of the slide deck. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I see the, the the first one on the on the yeah, slide um, so from uh, Malcolm. Uh, is there a quick clean option to the dust collection zone on the top of the fluid bed? It's it. it yep. Yeah, we can we we can Jim, put uh, maybe just stop. We're getting top. a lot of feedback uh, here. Um, yeah. Not sure if if you're catching that yeah. as well, but maybe uh, I see another one. Um, a, a microwave based question that I can take, and then we'll we'll try you uh, after that. 
Um, so the question uh, comes up, what, would there be any disadvantage, or I'm sorry, advantage or disadvantage in having the microwave guides entering the side or the bottom of the mixer rather than the top? That's uh, so, so thinking through the design of the, of the vessel itself, our clearance is typically at the top in a horizontal mixing vessel. Um, you really just need anywhere that you can get the uh, microwaves into the vessel while mixing it, and the top down tends to be the most optimal solution for that application. Let's go back to Malcolm's question uh, about getting access to the uh, uh, bag top unit. Uh, we can have, we have, can put doors on the side or quick access doors on the top, or uh, we could probably come up with an airlift. Um, you, there question is a here. flex connection between um, the two. One, so that um, uh, we could probably is, do or can microwave be too. used with metallic powders, uh, tungsten in my case? So, and then uh, with, there's a question. To that question, we have uh, over 600 Luke, tests that we've done uh, in our with lab. Regards to fluid bed dryers, to, is and there we have a many uh, metallic oxides heat specific and value uh, above molybdenum, which we do is not recommend. Also, material our that we've had some familiarity bed, with. Even with the back um, I can definitely effect. check to see if uh, tungsten is part of that. Um, but uh, I think that John, to answer uh, your question, could, is a strong possibility. Uh, go to relatively high temperatures. It depends on how heat sensitive the material is. Um, but uh, yeah, the back mixing effect uh, for very pasty materials is very important. Um, so maybe uh, at higher temperatures, maybe when we start getting up to the 500, 600 degree range, maybe that's uh, an area that we would uh, limit ourselves. Um, one question that is commonly asked about microwave is, is microwave safe to use in an industrial application? And the answer is yes, it's extremely safe. The thing that you want to achieve with microwave is not let it outside of your vessel. In our case, we've done a lot of testing and have developed chokes uh, that we have patented to make sure that any microwave outside of the vessel is well below an acceptable industry level uh, for that. Okay. Furthermore, um, we have another question from Jason. Direct uh, heating capabilities of microwaves to sort heats by the material size itself, product. and so Is it's not an actually to do heating a combination up of both screening the actual and machine. Using this so method. the outside temperature is very common uh, to have very low. a dewatering screen prior to drying or screening of larger I particles. I see uh, another uh, question so very common um, application that to could go to either way from from uh, Duggan. And uh, I might, might answer this. So um, from a microwave perspective, Duggan, you're, I'm sorry, I'll read the question. What is the lowest consistent temp that we can achieve for a biomass type application for the fluid bed? Can we get it around 130 degrees? So on the microwave side of the business, we approach these applications in two different ways. Uh, one would be a vacuum for very low temperature drying applications. And one would be an atmospheric using air for some evaporative cooling. So to, to, low, to keep a biomass organic material around 130 degrees is possible with a microwave dryer. Yes, uh, for fluid bed, um, uh, we could, uh, yes. uh, the problem with, with a, a yeah, typical gotcha. direct yes, dryer. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, through the testing process, we would develop empirical data that then we use calculations to upscale. So, I think that we. Uh, one, uh, one other question, very common to microwave, um, is come down to about 130 me, degrees Fahrenheit, not put uh, but foil it would be a very microwave. large dryer. So, that's how do you pump microwave energy into a huge stainless steel device? And that's a, a really simple answer, and that's because we're heating the material. So if you had enough material in you your home it, microwave you know, we have a resonance all time that 1,000 watt the, power, um, then you can put as much tinfoil as you want in there. 
Yes, uh, Jim, it says, Jim mentioned residence time and how understanding this lends to upscale, upscaling equipment. Is that something that Marion does? How do you, yeah, do you I scale have up a on question on time? wave mix about whether or not it can be used in a continuous process line from John. Right now, the technology is developed and designed for batch processes, but I would typically challenge continuous applications because the return on the machine can be so strong that sometimes it, it's very possible to run two parallel batch processes. Uh, to in, achieve a continuous throughput. Let's take two more, Jim. Is there? Do you do you have another one from a uh, fluid bed standpoint? There's a question now from uh, Charles. Uh, we dry PET powder of 5,000 pounds per hour. Do you have a process for that? Uh, yeah, it's a very typical application for the caisson fluid bed. Uh, and uh, it depends on how low a moisture you have to go. Uh, if it's whether it's surface moisture or bound moisture. Um, so yes, uh, uh, we would like to know more information about that application. Okay, I see. See, one, we're going to take one more question. I do see um, another question about wave mix and what is the what is the batch size limitation. It's a uh, it's very material dependent, but the the machine range and it's a batch process. Uh, we go up through 400 cubic foot machines, so the uh, the overall batch size on the high end would be up to 12,000 pounds based on bulk density. Yes, uh, here we have. Um, a, with that, Malcolm, I'm going to toss this back over to Lee. What would be the main Lee deciding Islands factor to, when choosing a Dynapore plate ahead of a perforated plate? during design specification for fluid bed dryers. Okay, we haven't talked about the Dynapore plate, but it is a sintered plate with the, the largest hole is about seven, 75 microns. So it, it handles powders very nicely. One of the issues you have with the fluid bed dryer, if you shut down the uh, airflow before and still have product a fine product in the bed, it can sift down through the plate and then you get some cross contamination. So the Dynapore plate will allow you to keep or minimize the amount of any sifting that goes through the plate. So that would be the advantage of a Dynapore plate would be. Jim and Jason, thank you so much for a fantastic webinar and sharing your incredible knowledge um, to this group, we are we are grateful, and we certainly do hope that uh, you have found this webinar beneficial. Again, Henry Alamza and I, uh, Henry being the president and CEO at Kason, would just like to thank all of you on behalf of our teams for your time and consideration. And as we say at both Marion and Kason, our job is to be an asset to you as you look at different alternatives in solving problems and issues of, of uh, processing. And when we, when we do that and provide you with knowledge and listen well and ask the right questions, we consider ourselves an asset to help you make solid business decisions. That is our goal. And uh, we, we will continue to strive to achieve that. Should any of you have any further questions, please don't hesitate uh, to contact Marion or Kason. Uh, we are certainly at the ready to serve you and add value to your decision process. So with that, I just want to say to everyone, please stay safe and healthy. And we look forward to hosting another webinar very soon. Again, thank you so much for your time.